I think your analysis was very straight line. The street doesn't run in a straight line. Kid, you cannot tell your neighbor he is stealing ducks when you are stealing phones. As High Commissioner, I was wrong. As Charandas Prasad, I reacted naturally how any person would have. I did not come here for food for that kind of abuse. I did not come here for that kind of abuse. If you're going to go down that road, I'll walk off. But it's all okay once they're talking. If they were talking, I could not have been here today. You got ADHD. I got that. No, 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 no. I think I've done enough in terms of taking our team um, out of trouble from losing. Come on, Lord Taylor. You got, got screwed. I'm reading the script now, and the first person that comes to my mind to play a detective, yes, but an erratic detective, is Rodriguez. Why you not freaking supper in young? Why you man and supper woman? Look, you deal with that. You deal with that. We must encourage platforms like this because it brings together different people and allows for discussions to, to take place in our country on a multiplicity of fundamental issues. Kingdom, you apologizing for no, something no, 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 you no, think no. I did is wrong. I don't no. want you to do that and you should not have done that. You're watching the Gilgavi Freddy Kisun show based in time zones wherever you are. It's good evening, good morning, good afternoon. We come to you thrice weekly. When Mondays, Wednesdays, Fridays, 8.30 to 9.30. It's a live program. If you go onto your smart TV and go to YouTube or Guyana Critic, Guyanese Critic Facebook page, there you will see us live in the studio. Our guest this evening is quite, it's a, how should I put it? It's unusual in that for the year that we've been running, we never had such a guest discuss such a topic. So we're extremely grateful for his presence. This is the first time since this program started last year, June. We've had someone with the experience, the capacity, and the qualification to discuss journalism. Before I introduce you, introduce him, let me show you him in action. Operator, can you show us in action? Good morning, my name is Neil Marks and this is the newsroom on eNetworks. We're live at the High Court where Justice Franklin Holder is expected to uh, hear a case brought before him uh, blocking the recount of votes cast on March 2nd. Uh, there are many applicants here this morning who have asked the judge to throw that injunction uh, to discharge it to allow the recount uh, to go ahead so that the final results for these elections uh, could be declared. Uh, but there is a problem here this morning as uh, there's limited access uh, into the High Court. We were told that only a certain amount of media persons are allowed into the courtroom as well as a certain number of international observers. That person you were looking at is Neil Marx. One of Guyana's longest serving journalists, I think he has chopped up more than 20 years as a practicing journalist, 20 consecutive years. And we are quite elated this evening to have such a person discuss a topic on the Gildari Freddy Kisun show that has not been discussed before. Neil, I've known you when we were working at Kaicho News um, together. Thanks for being here, and no it's problem. really a pleasure. I, I don't think we're going to get in one hour because there's so much 
to discuss with journalism. Well, let me say, let me ask you this, that clip that we showed, um, that must always be in your memory because even though you were known as a journalist and you worked at the Chronicle as um, deputy editor, you worked at Kaicho News, I think you were catapulted into fame for five months in March to July 2020. Do you subscribe to that? That thing was going on for five months and every day there was your face. Well, I, I don't think we thought about it, Freddie. It was just us. Um, thank you for having me, by the way. I think it was just us um, doing the job, oblivious to um, the effects that it was having. We certainly understood at that time um, the reach of the newsroom um, during those elections. I, I was mentioning to you earlier that newsroom is now, today the most widely broadcast uh, news um, program in the country. I say that because during the elections time, um, if our news was one minute late, you'll get a call, somebody will message you from Paramakatoy or some river in area. And we never understood at that time the impact that the, we were having. So in any mountain, in every, any river community in Guyana, you can access the newsroom because of the satellite TV service that was set up by eNetworks. So yeah, that was certainly an interesting uh, five months. Okay. Uh... I'm looking at the camera, and I will ask you if you could draw your seat closer to mine sure. and look straight to the camera there. So um, just now I see we will, we need to see this famous, viewers need to see this famous journalist. Um, Neil, 20 years of journalism. Uh, to ask you for your reflections would take more than an hour, but let's, let's tell our viewers how you started, what brought you into journalism, and then we'll talk about what kept you for 21 years in journalism. And I want to go back to that five-month period because I think in that five-month period, you, Neil Marks, defined journalism. Which part in the world a journalist and journalists are reporting on an election results that took five months. But let's start with your origin. Why not medicine? Why not law? Why, why journalism? I would have probably kill somebody if it was medicine. You would probably uh, kill somebody if it was what? If it was medicine. <laughs> um, uh, so I started in journalism really by fluke. Um, because when I came out of high school, I lived in Enmore on the East Coast, right next to the Sugar Estate. And I attended Golden Grove Secondary, that's Golden Grove, the village next door to Enmore. And um, so after uh, secondary school, after CXC, I started doing um, accounts work with a construction company. And after the first project, I realized, um, I, I think I confirmed rather that I hated maths. I didn't like um, anything to do with, um, with figures. And so I started looking for something else after that project ended. And I looked for vacancies and there was an um, advert in the newspaper for a carpet inventory clerk at Libron, Germany. You would remember that. I know that right thing. <laughs> what it was. Yeah. So I was... Dublin Street. So I was heading to that job um, this, this Monday morning and I remember I was in the speedboat um, bridging who by that time had moved to Lagrange on over the river. And um, I was in the speedboat heading to this job and I opened a newspaper and there was a vacancy for media trainees at um, NBC 42, the channel on Cam Street. Yeah. And I thought that that was interesting. So um, I thought, let me find out what this is about. I had no idea what the word media meant. But I remember on the interview, um, the person asked me if I think I could ask questions and get people to respond. And I, and I said, yes, that's something that I can do. And so they sent me out on the road to do one of those uh, box Bob, the man in the street. So I did that, and that's really how I started. Um, at that time, it was, uh, it was early, it was late 1997, early 1998. At that time, Guyana was just, I guess, rebuilding democracy after 1992. So UNESCO and um, the IDB and the government of Guyana had this program. Uh, it was a two-one training program to what they said was to rehabilitate the media in Guyana after that period. So I attended that two-one program. Uh, they trained you in TV, newspaper, 
and radio uh, journalism. So I sat in on that program for two months and that's how I started. I went to MTV, which was quite popular at the time. And uh, then I moved on to the Ghana Chronicle and explored other media houses as time went on. Well, I know you certainly were the Kaicho News. Neil, it's been more than 20 years. What, what for you, were, um, what sustained you in journalism? Listen, I think after medicine and teaching, it's perhaps the third most important profession in the world after medicine and teaching. Journalists bring to the world the things that people need to know. So my question is, as you went on year one, year two, you got to like it? Yeah, I, I got to love it. I don't think that I could do anything else than, than what I do. And I didn't stay, um, I have to tell you, Fred, because of the pay, because journalism doesn't pay. Mm -hmm. we're, we're one of the lowest paid workers in the country, perhaps in the world. I know certainly in Guyana, we don't get any sort of money in, in journalism. So it wasn't a pay. I think it, I, as time went on, I, I grew to love it and realized that this is what I should be doing. I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. And sometimes I, I look back at it. I, I can't understand how I... I came to love it that much. But I remember in the mid 90s when I was in secondary school, that time there were all sorts of crises in the world. Um, I remember on Sundays, I, I would be very anxious to read the newspaper and I loved reading international news. I think in the mid 90s, there was um, the Bosnian war. I remember the siege of Sarajevo, um, the genocide in Rwanda, and those things captivated me. I read them. Um, I followed those things very closely. And so when sometimes in, in retrospect, I think it was um, that early read reading um, of the news that, that got me to love it. And as time went by, um, I sought out whatever training opportunities and so on that I could do. And I, um, that's what sustained me really loving it and wanting to do it. So you think if you're given an offer to do PR job for a firm or to go into some other company where the pay is good, but it wouldn't involve journalism, would you take it? No, I, I don't think I would. I, I, I mean, look, things are changing. I've been in this profession for a very long time. And if there's an opportunity for me to do other work, I, I will do it. But I can't see myself not practicing journalism. Well, I guess you're stuck with it for a few decades to come because you just returned from the UK doing a master's in journalism. Yes, I, um, like I said, over the years, I, I, did, I never went to the University of Guyana because there isn't a journalism program there. There is a communications program, which doesn't really cater uh, for the work um, that journalists do. Um, over years in the media houses that I worked for, we would bring in interns from time to time from the University of Guyana from their communications program. And I realized that, you know, these people aren't being trained for the job that we do. And so I never went to the university. And so it, it was um, many years after that election saga, I felt that I needed a break. I needed to leave Guyana a bit. And uh, so I pursued um, educational opportunities. So I went to City University in London to do a master's in international journalism. Well, when you see you, when you saw you for five months, you certainly needed a break. It's every day the world the region in Guyana was watching. And I think you defined yourself and you defined journalism in those five months. And I, I, I think that contribution of yours is going to last a long time when the name journalism comes up. But let me ask you something about those five months because I want to talk about those five months. What is it like because I've been in journalism, but I haven't been doing what you were doing for that five months. You were there every day seeing a, an election unfold and people trying to tamper with a, an election results. Not for three days, not for 30 days, but for five months. What was going through your mind as you get up in the morning and you have to go outside the court? You have to go at Ashmins. What was there any time you say, listen, what I've seen, I had enough? Never. I think, um, I mean, this is, I mean, while the situation was 
as horrible as, as it was. This is the job the journalists um, live their lives to do. I mean, we have, I think during that time, it wasn't us getting up day by day thinking we have to go to work. We understood the importance of the moment and we understood that this was our job. I mean, the, the work of journalists really is to hold uh, truth to power and, and hold the authorities accountable, regardless of who they are. And so we didn't estim underestimate um, the position that we held to really ensure that democracy prevailed in Guyana. We aren't champions um, of democracy in that way and fighting for uh, free and fair elections and all of that. But by necessity, our job gets us involved. And I think that as journalists, that is, uh, you know, the work that we have to do. We saw that there was a very naked attempt to rig the elections. That was very clear. And we knew that it was our our privilege and our responsibility to ensure um, that the votes of people counted. Uh, we're going to come back to the election results. Uh, we're going to go back to your, that f five months. Uh, my wife uh, was just uh, in child uh, O'Neill on again. Um, I can tell you, you, you certainly, you certainly put journalism on the Guyanese map in those five months. I certainly looked at you every day. Was there any time in those five months you felt threatened? Um, that was a terrible period in it, there were there were many days um when i was sometimes um it would be from people on the road sometimes when we were i remember when we were outside of the uh ashman not ashman's the recon center there? yes the recon the Arthur John well, conference yeah. center yeah, because we, we were broadcasting live from outside of the center so um, cars were per passing, people would, would cuss up and carry on. Some people, some people on the other hand were very kind. There were days that people thought that they could bring something to help us in, in doing our job. Um, there were people who sent messages through your Facebook page and other means uh, to threaten you and tell you about, you know, all sorts of things. Um, so yeah, there were those times that those things happened, but n nothing, um, you know, as serious enough to say, listen, I have to come off the air for today or, or whatever. Never. I don't think that I ever felt that way on any day. There was any particular, particular incident involving you alone in which people identify you and say, that's Neil Marx? Uh, you mean in a threatening way? In, during the five months, yeah. Um, uh, <laughs> Not that I can remember. One incident sticks out in my mind, but it was after the elections, after uh, the president was sworn in. I was uh, driving home and there was uh, this guy, it was bumper to bumper traffic, it's on the East Bank. Mm. And um, there was this guy in the car and, you know, I drive with the, the windows down and he saw me and he recognized me and he said, you know, he called out my name and he started to curse me in, in the most nasty way. And uh, I... I wasn't crossing the bridge, I was going way up on the East Bank, and he followed me all the way and kept doing that. And then I, I wanted to answer him, but then when I when I was about to um, to shout something at him, I realized that the person next to him was recording me. And so um, I decided not to answer him and to wind up my window and put on my music. And I went home. I think that that incident, um, you know, really stood out in my mind that, that people could go to that extent. Um, so I, I suppose to intimidate you. Uh, um, but at any point in time, do you think the occupants of that car intention was to hurt you? No, I, I didn't feel that way. I, I, I think that it was just just, just being yeah, um, being mischievous opportunistic and, and, yeah, yeah. and mischievous. Yeah, at that point in time. We'll come back to the election period in your life as a journalist. So you've completed a master's in journalism, which will make you one of the few people, I think, in this country that has a master's, um, that have master's in journalism. Now, with that, with that, I think you're more now attached to the profession. What, what I want to say is we've had people here who are extremely talented, not talented, extremely talented in the theater, in the arts and what have you. And they all came here and they complained about this, this salary. I hope someone like you with 
21 years in journalism, 21 consecutive years, and a master's. I hope the financial future looks secure. I hope so too. <laughs> I, I'm not badly paid at the moment, I must say. Okay. Um, now, you know you were in the news recently. You report the news, but you happen to be, you were reported on in the news. Uh, that was the um, Guyana Press Association elections. I I thought I, I'm i on the list of voters, but I didn't know where to check check it and I, I certainly would have voted for you I think you were on the list I I think it's three years you stay on the yes I think I was on the list mm. but I didn't have access to that thing to check it but I don't care what people say I, I never cared what people say since I was growing up in Watmanville I would have voted for you I think you're one of the finest journalists this country has produced I think you and Leonard Gildari stand out as journalists who love the profession and will do things for it. And I think you and Gildari have put journalism on the map. I can't think of anyone who is in journalism today that has chalked up 20 years and still around. I, I think there's the editor of the Starbuck News, but outside of him, it's certainly you now. I'm going to ask you a straightforward question without any nicety to it. Was that GPA election uh, legitimate with all the legal um, things attached to it that made it a credible process? I would say the process was legitimate. The actual everything else that was involved in in it was not so i would say that the process was legitimate but it couldn't be counted as, as credible um was it was it is it true that there was a deliberate attempt not to allow the voters list to be made public or people to have access to it days before the voting. What was that a decision? And if that was a decision, was it a legitimate decision by the bona fide executive? Can I tell you how the process ran? Yeah, yeah. So in uh, when I, I, I was a president of the GPA before and um, when I ran for the presidency, there was uh, no uh, voters list. There was no voters list to um, to present because there was no challenger, so there was no need for a vote at that time. So and there was no so because there was no challenger, no one requested to see a voters list. That was the same case uh, when Azima first ran for president, Azima Ragubir. Um, I nominated her for the presidency and there was no challenger. So there was no need for anybody to ask for a voters list. This time around, however, um, we knew that Nazima intended to run for the presidency. And I was seeking election at that time because I, I think it was time for me um, to uh, have that position again in order to advance the cause of journalism in Guyana. So I requested um, a voters list because I thought that that was in fairness because you can't have an incumbent on an executive determining the electoral process and the other party doesn't have the benefit of knowing the ins and outs. So I requested a voters list and that was denied. It was denied on the basis that the convention was that a voters list is never presented to the public or to members beforehand. And I argued um, that other conventions were broken, so this one could be broken. The other convention that was uh, broken was that in the in the year that I ran for the presidency and the year uh, and the two years after that that Nazima ran, um, we accepted uh, uh, application forms and we accepted payments from members on the very election day. So it was only on the election day that you could have possibly had a voters list because people are now coming in, they're paying, um, they qualify for membership and they're allowed to vote. So the convention was broken because this executive decided, uh, I think two weeks in advance, that um, 
membership Jews would be cut off and that they would not be accepting new members to the GPA in order to vote for the elections. And I knew that that um, was crap, for want of a better word, because I was aware that uh, new members to the executive were being signed up while others were not. For example, we have a whole list of people at the newsroom who um, would not have qualified for membership to vote simply on the basis that the executive at the time said no new members were were going to be admitted so you can't vote so what's the point in um applying for membership at that time there was no rush so all of those people did not sign up and weren't eligible to vote on the other hand um, the executive claimed that they had an outreach where they went to various media houses um to seek new members and indeed that's what they did they did go to media houses but those media houses where they think that they could gain membership to vote for them on elections day so on that basis i say that the results the elections could not have been credible because uh, members were solicited that would vote for the um, executive all four remaining executives on the gpa in the last under the last body they all ran for um, office again do you think what's what's your attitude what's your opinion to the future credibility of the Ghana press association this thing was given white press publicity on this show it was discussed twice i think the minister of labor had objections to a lawyer who was supposed to be independent he being the presiding officer um but schmidt that th that whole episode was so sordid that it has to dent the credibility of the GPA. And I I wonder if powerful policymakers would want to reach out to the GPA after what happened there. Your your take? I I do believe that I don't believe that the current GPA executive has the credibility. Um, I don't think that they can command any respect from anybody. I, I mean. Reporters, journalists, members of the media, our job is to, to, to be the watchdog in society. We advocate for transparency, for accountability, and all that good stuff. And if we can practice it within our own membership body, then that is a massive problem. And so the executive that exists, which um, was voted in on the basis of um, what I would consider a less than uh, transparent process cannot now ask somebody a question on credibility and accountability. And I very I feel very strongly about that. And I think that was one of the um, the, the worst results that we could have hoped for from those elections. Um, Neil, I want to um, I want to show you something, and I want to ask you as one of the longest serving. I, I think it has to be you and and Anpasad. I've been in journalism a long time, and I don't know anyone working at any of the newspapers, state-owned or private, television station. I don't know anyone who have chalked up more than 20 consecutive years. I want to ask you your opinion of this as one again, a longer serving journalist. Let me put this up to the screen there. Yeah, well, to let me show. See I don't know yeah, what you're showing me. Is there a Lone Ranger at Starbuck News? Hmm. Now, I I got a complaint from Dr. Randy Randolph Passard, professor at American University that is doing uh, a stint with the Office of the President as an advisor. He's a high-level professor at the American University, and I think he's here working with the government. He complained to me that, look, something is wrong here. For months, my letters are not being published. So I, 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 I saw comments from the different people involved. I saw the comment from the president of the Ghana Press Association, and this is what she said to me, and I reported it in, in my column here for, in the Chronicle. She said, I am not giving a comment because I am not the Guyana Press Association. You have to talk to the Guyana Press Association. Now, I, I reported that here. Um, in all my 35 years in journalism, I know you can go to the head of any corporation, any organization, and they would say, they would give you a comment and they would say, that is my uh, opinion. 
I don't speak for the executive and it would have to be taken to the executive. But she told me, I cannot speak to you. I cannot offer a comment. I am not the GPA. You have to go through a nine member committee of the GPA. I don't think that obtains anywhere in the world. Why can't I ask, why can't I ask the head of Republic Bank, the head of Banks DIH, the head of judiciary, for a comment. Why do I have to write to the whole judiciary? Why do I have to write a letter to Banks DIH? I, I, that's, 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 that's crazy. I think you've answered your question yourself. But that's, that's, what, that's what she told me. Um, but let's look, let's, look at, let's look at this thing about um, Dr. Passad not getting his letters published um, for months now. Could that be right? I, I, I would want to refrain from commenting on, on, on the, the I, I don't know, understand what the editorial policy of the Starbrook News is. I've, I've, I've never worked there. Um, but certainly I, I can say that the Starbrook News has been very generous in uh, publishing letters from members of the public. So if somebody's complaining, I, I would find that very strange. Okay, thanks. Now, your experience in journalism, you worked for the Chronicle, you worked for Starbuck News. I did and not then... work for Starbuck News. I've never worked well, for the Starbuck News. The Kaicho News. I, yes. Yeah. Uh, what's what's the, the high points and the low points? We're not we're going to come to the election because that has to feature a big part in your, if you're going to write a book or you're going to give an interview. And I am not going to let you get away when 9.30 reaches without going back to that election period. Because as I said before, that period defined Neil Marx and it was a defining moment in journalism. Leaving out the five months, which we will come back to, what was your experience like at NBC, uh, Chronicle, Kaicho? I know you, I know you a long time and I know you're not like me. You're very guarded, you're very cautious, and you're not going to want to say it without mincing your words. Well, what was your experience like? Um, I've had um, an extremely, extremely good run. That sounds like I'm winding and I'm not, but I've had an extremely good run. I think it was the stories that helped to change people's lives that um, I... Uh, I, I would say were my high points. Um, I'll give you one example. Um, there was this time I went to this little village. Um, oh goodness, what's his name now? I think, is it Swan? Swan oh. is not in the River? No, it's on the, the on the highway. Um, I don't remember. Oh yes, yes, yeah, yeah no, it's, it's definitely in the highway. I know Swan. Swan? Right. Anyways, know, so it there's was, a little creek there. Yeah, yes. but anyways, it was this little community in, in, the, um, in, in the back there and um, the children had this, uh, they had like a board basically to go down to their boats. Sometimes if, if the water is too high, it means they have trouble getting into their boats. And um, I remember just taking a picture and wondering, you know, whether this will have any impact. And I was very happy um, later on to learn that those people, um, because of that picture that was published, they then had a, a proper war for the children um, to get into their boats to go home after school and to get to school. So I think it, it was it's little things that, that like that that um, have had great meaning for me in the work that I do. Um, certainly, there were many interesting experiences uh, throughout the years. I started. Tell, my, tell us, tell us some. We got time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I started my career um, when there was the challenge to the presidency of Janet Jagan. Um, yeah. So I was this little stupid reporter on the street with a camera and not understanding all the implications of what was happening. I remember I was on um, that corner camp and Middle Street, um, and there was this massive protest coming down the road and I remember um, what one person shouting to me and saying um, I, I won't use the expletive but um, to say that um, Kulibai you're brave to be on the road because like I said it was, I, it was I, equivalent to that yeah because I, I wasn't uh, I guess I didn't understand racial politics so deeply in Guyana and so to that person I should not me an Indian should not have been on the road um, with all of these protesters coming down the road and so on 
Um, but I continue to do that. And throughout my um, career, um, I've had to deal with those experiences. Um, so it was the, um, so that was early 1998. And then we had elections in 2001, 2006. I would say the one in 2001, 2006, um, there was all sorts of trouble that we got into um, as journalists. I worked at MTV at that time and we had a little uh, gray bus that took us everywhere. So everybody knew that bus. So whenever we were um, coming up on the road, people knew it was MTV coming up. And I mean, the very nature of, of politics and the very nature of the media in Guyana um, has elements of polarization. So um, while, you know, the Indian population loved us at MTV, the other half did not like us. And so, um, like, we couldn't go to Boston to cover anything. They see that little um, bus coming up the road, and we'd have to turn around. I remember um, one election night when the elections officials were being held up in the school in Sophia. When we went in there, they tried to run our bus off the road. Um, many times, um, I'll, I'll tell you two experiences that were very interesting. Um, during the court cases at the high court, um, when one of the uh, when the judge had thrown out the case um, against um, John Jagan at the time, um, we we called the bus for um, pickup, and uh, obviously um, the driver's nervous and all of that. And I told him where to pick me up. When I got out of the court, you had like that whole avenue were probably full of protesters and whatnot, and there were the barricades there. And uh, so I told him where to pick me up, and he never showed up at that spot. And so I came out of the gate and there was this, this group of protesters running towards me. And um, a woman I'll never forget, Andrea Roller, she was the PRO of the People's National Congress at the time. She literally held onto me and grabbed me and pulled me in their bus and drove off so that I could be saved. And um, another time, um, it was the first time Robert Corbyn ran for the presidency and lost the elections. That was 2006, you may remember that yeah, better yeah, than me, Freddie. Yeah, yeah. um, but we were at Congress Place. And what usually happens during elections time or big events, international journalists would um, come into the country and they would embed themselves with local media houses. So we had this guy uh, from uh, an agency in New York come and, and be with us at MTV. And he, we went into Congress Place together. And um, again, we were not very liked at Congress Place at the time. And uh, he asked some sort of question that a whole group, of, a whole full room full of people did not like. They weren't the politicians, they were, these were the activists and supporters. And it, it was literally hell for us to get out of Congress Place that day. And again, Andrea came and she said, I'm gonna take you out. And she held onto my hand and she walked me out um, of Congress Place all the way to the gate so that we could get into our transportation and leave safely. Um, during the crime wave, um, our office was located on Regent Street and um, one day bullets just fled, you know, they riddled our building with bullets. Um, and we were we were all on the floor of, of our um, news agency at that time. Um, so those experiences I, I remember very vividly because you know, they were frightening moments, um, but we were journalists and like I said, like like sometimes you get an adrenaline and these things happen because this is your profession, this is what you live for. You want to cover those events and sometimes, um, you know, harm could come your way. Yeah, I know. I, I remember the 1992 election, the GCOM was in Cold Street and I was with Father Morrison and the deputy editor of the Celtic Standard, Colin Smith. And people were literally pelting huge bricks at us. And it just makes you feel that you want to do it. You want to do it because I'm... Um, you don't set of people we are. Um, but I want, I want, um, I'm speaking to a person who have covered some eventful d directions and misdirections in Guyanese sociology, in Guyanese social life. You just talk about the crime wave. You talk about um, the period with Mrs. Jagger, and that was a period of slow fire, more fire. Indeed. Um, the night on the street, uh, particularly in Region Street, they were cutting the, the, the fire engine hoses because they had lit um, Gimpex which is a building right. owned by the PPP. Were you around? Right, the... our office was right next right. door to Gimpex, yeah. And you um, 
and you saw so we we saw everything on regent street everything was happening on regent street at that time and we had we had our own um little <laughs> crevices that we used to look through so we saw everything that happened we saw when people bought gas from the gas station and came out to the road and spill it on light fires we saw everything and you're talking about bricks one of one of our cameras have you got those things in on film i hope mtv still has them but yeah we did film all of it yeah. well i know they have um, Ronald Waddell going to the gas station to um, fill up gas to burn the city. I know MTV still has that uh, that that footage, but I don't remember Mr. Waddell, but I do remember an individual. But I know Mr. Waddell. It was shown. MTV showed it. Okay. And mm -hmm. then um, the police um, went after him, and he, he ran away, and what have you. Uh, but let's come back to the defining moment of Neil Marx. March to July 2020. What what did you capture the mood of three sides? The opposition PPP and the nine parties, the incumbent and the observer. Did, did you were you able to discern um what how they were thinking? and where this thing would eventually lead to because the Jamaican, the Trinidad Prime Minister came and he said, it's not going to end well. You felt like that? Um, it, I think at that time, everybody were in sort of shock and awe that, um, that I think before the elections, when I was talking to people, you're talking to diplomats, you're talking to other people and people are saying, you know, it's, basically saying it's impossible for you to want to rig an elections in this day and age and um, i don't think anybody believed this and then when it started to unravel you're like is this really happening and i think that that was the mood of everyone at that time and day by day it, the moments became more anxious it's like how far is this going to um, go and is it going to continue? How will it stop? I don't think anybody had an answer in those five months until that fateful Sunday morning when um, we learned that a declaration was going to be made and the president was going to be sworn in on August 2nd. It, I, you know, it, the moments just rolled by like, like you get up one day, you go to work, you're wondering what is going to happen today. And you, you know, is it going to be a, a hard day? Is it going to be a tough day? Is this going to be the day when it's going to going to happen i you know i think many days we prepared for a swearing in and a swearing in never happened because as it happened you you're like okay it has to stop here it has to stop here it can't go anymore and it just kept going and going and going where were you describe some of the times um where you were I, 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 I could enumerate some. Were you there when um, Mingo went on the balcony to make the declaration? No, I wasn't there that day. Um, this all started, I believe. Um, so Monday we had the elections. Tuesday night, Tuesday night, all the dramas started to play out when we realized that, you know, the count for region, the tabulation for region four, four was in trouble. And none of it made sense what was happening the excuses for not counting uh continuing the count and not having uh returning officers and all of that it so all started to happen there so i worked that entire night that tuesday night into wednesday morning we were going live all the time and so the wednesday and the thursday during the day our other reporters were there in the building mind you we it was the strangest elections that i've ever covered in, in, i mean that may be an understatement but in terms of access the media always had access to a media center at an elections commission during um elections time you have a, a room set up you have computers you can stay there and work um, at times they were very generous to provide us with meals so the media is always very well taken care of given our role in you know telling the world about the transparency of this process and so that w this was the only time we did not have access to the media center the media center was in that ashman's building uh, there are many times when i try to bluff my way past security to get into that building and they would not allow you and so we had no space to work in the ashman's building so our access 
media was not allowed in that. If you got into Ashmansville, then you had to sneak your way in. And um, so a, a lot of the times we depended on people who were in the building to feed us information outside. That, that was the kind of restricted environment that we worked in during that time. Uh, just certainly during those days. So for the for the day when Mingo made his declaration, I think it was March 6, uh, we weren't actually in that building because we could not get in. So we relied on everything that was coming out at that time from other people. Well, it had to be, you, know, you don't, you don't say it. Let, let me say it because I know your temperament. Your temperament is not to go for the jugular. It would have been people like Wax and Myers and other GCOM officials that have, would, would have given the order. It would have been the police could not have tell the um, police could not have dictated to the media that you can't go in there. It had to be GCOM people. Yeah, it, it had to be officials on the on, on in the GCOM secretariat. So it had to be either the CEO or DCO. I don't know who was responsible entirely for that area, but it would have had to be in them. Yeah, somebody. Either Mr. Lewinfield or, or Ms. Myers, I'm, I'm not sure who it was, um, but we certainly did not have access to that media center after the, there was one press conference, I believe, that was held after the elections and after that, that room was closed to us. And actually, I think that um, it, was, it was the same room or the adjacent room that was used when, um, remember, the foreign minister uh, speaking with uh, observers and... Um, and that whole fiasco took place. I don't know if you remember when Owen Art at the time basically abused out um, uh, the foreign minister to say you can't come in here come and come tell us. Okay, stuff. Come, yes. come. Now, yeah. the, I'm coming to that. So that's one, Mingo on the balcony. Two, the confusion that the world saw, the um, GCOM chairman in a room and people think she is dead. I was live on air at that time when that was happening. And uh, we, uh, one of our reporters was on the ground. I don't remember if it was Kurt or Bibi, um, but they were on the ground covering that madness. That was, that was, that was certainly a day. Um, and like I said, because of the restricted access, we had a hard time figuring out what was happening actually in the building. And we, we had to be fed information, but we were certainly outside of that building and getting as much information as we could from people who went in and out of it. We weren't allowed in. Uh, at that time in the building with the confusion, did, did anyone in the media, including yourself, felt that there was danger, something was happening to did 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 you come chairman? Yes, you yes, we we did get the sense that something was amiss. Like I said, but we weren't eyewitnesses to it, so we couldn't, you know, determine for ourselves. We just had to, and you know, there were some crazy moments because I remember. I Tell was, us about those crazy I, moments. I was I, you were right there. Yeah, I, yeah. So I remember that I was live on air, and we switched right away, and. As soon as the camera switched to Ashman's building, there was a security guard yelling, oh, God, they kill Shisha dead, you know, that kind of. <laughs> so th things were happening so fast. It was, you know, in a live situation, it's really hard to control what comes out of it. Certainly, we would not have wanted that woman to come on saying that because we couldn't establish that right away. Um, but, yeah, there were there were. <laughs> Yeah, it, 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 there were rough times when we were here. Um, one of the most interesting moments for me, though, during that entire period, I'll tell you. We, like, so when the decision was made to do the recount, because Newsroom was, was live, and I think that people looked to us as the authority in covering the elections at the time, we thought that we should cover the recount live. And we went about um, securing equipment and so on that we thought that would achieve that objective because at that time they had already determined that they will have 10 counting stations. So we determined, okay, we need 10 cameras. How are we going to get it out to people? Blah, blah, blah. I was in constant communication with the chair of the Elections Commission at the time. Um, certainly Mr. Lowenfield wasn't taking my calls at that time. Um, he knew your number, so he was. I, I, you know, I don't know whatever reason whether he was busy or he changed his phone. I'm not sure, but I could not get on to him. So I was communicating with the chairman of the elections commission, and I was emphasizing um, to her the the need for this uh, process to be covered live. Um, to her credit, I can say that she did try, um, but in the end, the decision was made that um, we would not have access to cover. Um, the recount live 
and that they would give us a feed and we would carry that. So we said, fine. The morning when the actual count started, I, I tried again and she said that she would allow me in to see the opening of the first set of ballot boxes for the recount. So uh, we went into the Artichon Conference Center. That was a whole hassle to get in there because media <laughs> ain't getting in there. So after we established that we were in there were, com there were comical parts of that yeah. election. <laughs> We were we when we established that we were invited by the chair of the elections commission to enter the conference center. Um, we we got in. Um, first, we tried to go around to see where the um, the ballot boxes were in the containers, but then security quickly ushered us back in, and we went through the front door. From the moment we cleared the security, this to me was the most startling moment for me when I thought that the chair of the elections commission was no longer in control of this process um, because she invited me in and I have all of this in, on video so anyone can, can verify it. Once we cleared the security at the conference center, um, Maxine Graham, who was, I believe, assistant commissioner, I think she's yes, now yes, retired. Yes. She came in front of the chair of the elections commission and said that we should, we cannot be in here. So she over, she ruled the decision of the chairman I, I, that we I'm, could not be in there. I'm going to look in the camera. I, this is such an important yeah, interview. This is such an important interview. This is our first time in this program that we're having a journalist. And I'm telling you, Neil, this is so absorbing. Go on. Yeah, so she um, she came up to the um, to the chairman and, and told her that, that we could not be there. A police and, officer? Yes, and we had to leave that building. I told my cameraman. You and could, the, chair, the chairman was right there? I, you and, could hear it on the live too. I was telling my cameraman, oh, because we were trying to capture this moment and they were telling us we can't record, but I was telling him, you know, record and all of that came over live, but don't let them see you recording. All of that came over because we understood the importance of that moment. So if we could capture it, regardless of how, you know, we could capture it, we decided to do that. And then after that, she said, uh, well, we had to leave the building. But then um, she's, we, they said, okay, they're going to let us film one of the thing, and then we had to leave. So we filmed the thing. Um, I think I was allowed to film it with my, um, my phone. So I did that because the cameraman had to leave the building. And um, after we left and we went back, it became even more crazy and outrageous because my phone rang down after I left that conference center because the chairman said that, um, I hope, <laughs> anyways, the chairman said at that time when, when she eventually got on to me um, that the people, oh, the, the, the elections officials, I don't know who they were, who told her that we had planned to device at the conference center and we had left devices in there, even though we had left. And that was an and, accusation yeah. you were against people? Yeah, that's what the chairman said. That included you? Yeah, that's what the chairman said. She said that even though we had left, the people were saying that we left devices there so we could record what going on. I know we got all of them powers, but <laughs> that's what they said. And um, <laughs> so I had to assure her, no, we did not. We left the conference center as we were instructed to do after I was allowed to take my phone, I believe it was, and take out the opening of the remaining ballots. So when when I, um, I don't know if my phone was on silent or something, but when I saw all these missed calls from the chairman, like, what happened and then I, when I when I you know we spoke that's what she said I was being accused of leaving devices in the conference center so there were so many bizarre things with that entire process you know it's it's really hard to comprehend when you do look back at, at it you um as you get older you plan to write a book and that would have that because most journalists write books yeah um except but, me yeah. but writing calls for a lot of time and a lot of dedication, which I haven't been able to do. Oh, but it certainly would be interesting to do something like that. that. I did I did try, but um, when you get absorbed in work, it's, it's difficult to focus on just this one thing. So I haven't been able to focus on that one thing. They have a program in the United States. I don't know if they have it anywhere else in the world. Remember, we're close to the U.S., so we look at U.S. programs all the time. Meet the press, in which the press meet and the journalists discuss things. If, in a, in, if I should say to you now, meet the press, I am the interviewer and I'm interviewing a set of journalists. 
about the topics. What top topics would you like to discuss with me? Uh, you mean you, Friday Kisun? The interviewer, no. The interviewer. Um, I don't know because I, I like to interview a range of, of people um, on a range of subjects. Um, well, I'm interviewing you now. Yeah. What topics would you like to tell me? Um, anything really. Um, there are a range of issues that interest me, so I, I, don't, I, I don't force myself into a bracket to interview one set of people on one set of issues. I like to explore different, different areas. Prioritize so, some of them. Um, definitely politics, issues of health, the issues of, of um, climate change. So you will put Those politics as number one? Yeah, because I think it's it's still something that people are interested in. I'll, I'll tell you something else. I tried to interview the leader of the opposition, and he um, I haven't been able to get a response in months um, to that request. So, uh, you know, sometimes, too, you might be interested in interviewing someone, but that someone is not interested in being interviewed by you. You, um, but why? I when I see him, I relax him. Why would he not want? I have known you. I don't you know if the other. message got on to him. I didn't speak with him directly. I, I, I called I his give, office. I will give you his messages. cell phone number when we leave here. I do have his cell number. Oh, and when did you but, call his cell? No, I, I thought that I would go through the process. I don't call his cell, team. man. We'll, we'll sort that out, I'm sure, at no, some no, point. If, you know, I think if, 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 if a proper request goes through and, and I don't get the decency of a response, I figure that person's not interested in talking to me. If, if as a journalist, um, one of your priorities in, in covering issues is politics, you're going to be busy for the next 10 years. We, we have a country where people, you put all the systems in place and people don't accept the results of the elections. Now, I have seen, the oppos I've read the opposition leader saying, the results of the election is because the incumbent, um, the, the, the ruling party, the central ruling party, bribe people. Mm. So that's one explanation. Do you anticipate we're going to have problems in 2025? You were there in the thick of 98, 2001, 2006, yeah. and then the crime spree, and then your big moment, the five months. So you, sh you should have a sense of what is to come, not only the analysts and the politicians. What is your sense of what is to come? Do you think we're going to have a system people say, no, this thing wasn't free and fair? Yeah. I, I, I really hope not, but because I don't think that this country um, can, can have uh, that level of... Okay of instability again where an electoral process um, is concerned but i certainly don't think that there will be a um a formidable enough challenge if okay. the politics remain the same as they are today let me ask my operator he said we have lost the feed will we still be on youtube operator so we, we're off the air we're off the air Okay, Neil, thanks for coming. No let me, problem. Uh, let me walk you out. He said we lost the feed. I, I don't know what, what happened there, but it, it, we're almost over when it... Let, let, let's ask him what happened. I don't know what, what happened there, but 